All right, greetings everyone. Welcome to another PNP Live. My name is Bashan. I am part of the event staff at Politics and Pros. Uh, before we do get started with today's event, just wanna go over a couple quick items. The first is that for anyone viewing this event, if you would like to ask a question of any of our authors, we would ask for you to place it in the Q&A box just so we can help keep track of it and facilitate the question and answer period. Additionally, um, Throughout this event, you'll be able to go to the chat section where you'll be able to find links that'll take you directly to Politics and Pro's website where you can find and purchase, ideally, a copy of uh, At What Cost. In addition to that, also Medicare for All, of uh, the two books that were written by all of our authors here. At What Cost confronts how globalization, financial speculation, monopolies, and control of science and technology have enhanced the ability of corporations and their allies to overwhelm influences of government, family, community, and faith. As corporations manipulate demand through skillful marketing and veto the choices that undermine their bottom line, free consumer choice has all but disappeared and with it, the personal protections guarding our collective health. At What Cost argues that the world created by 21st century capitalism is simply not fit to solve our most serious public health problems from climate change to opioid addiction. However, author and public health expert, Nicholas Freudenberg also shows that though the road is steep, human and planetary well-being constitute a powerful mobilizing idea for a new social movement, one that will restore the power of individual voice to our democracy. Dr. Nicholas Freudenberg is a distinguished professor of public health at the City University of New York Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy, director of the CUNY Urban Food Policy Institute, and founder of Corporations and Health Watch, a website that monitors the impact of corporations on health. Dr. Freudenberg is the author or co-author of five other books and more than 100 scientific articles. He, his work has been supported by the National Institutes of Health, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, <clears throat> excuse me, and the Open Society Institute. He is joined in conversation by Abdul El Sayed and Micah Johnson. Abdul El Sayed is a physician, epidemiologist, public health expert, and progressive activist. He rebuilt Detroit's health department after the city's bankruptcy as the youngest big city health commissioner in a major U.S. city. He ran for governor of Michigan in 2018 on a state level single payer platform in a bid endorsed by Senator Bernie Sanders, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, The Nation and Current Affairs. He holds a doctorate in public health from University of Oxford where he was a Rhodes Scholar and a medical degree from Columbia University. Do Dr. Micah Johnson is a physician and a healthcare researcher, writer and policy advisor. He served as a health policy fellow in the U.S. House of Representatives and has advised presidential campaigns on health care reform. He holds a degree in philosophy, politics, and economics from the University of Oxford, where he was a Rhodes Scholar, and he received his MD from Harvard Medical School. He is currently a resident physician in internal medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. Without any further ado, gentlemen, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Bashan. Really, really appreciate it. Um, we'll uh, we'll quickly chat through uh, our book, Medicare for All Citizens Guide. We'll hand it over to Nick, who will chat through uh, his book at what cost, um, and then uh, we'll share a conversation. You know, it's it's not by coincidence that uh, we're juxtaposed today, given uh, both of our books look centrally at the impact of corporations and corporatism on different aspects of our health, whether it is our healthcare system or more broadly our public health. And I think. Uh, both books uh, end in a resounding call to rethink the implications of corporatism uh, when it comes to understanding uh, what it is we can do with uh, with the circumstances that we find ourselves in when it comes to, to health. Uh, our book um, was intended to take on a topic that uh, has been uh, deeply politicized over the past five years for good reason, because it speaks to uh, the circumstances in which all of us uh, have to deal with uh, getting health care uh, in the circumstances of our illness. And uh, our healthcare system in, in so many ways has failed 
uh, the test of, of, of this COVID-19 crisis as it has failed uh, millions of people before that. 67% of all bankruptcies are attributable, are attributable to healthcare in this country. And, um, and part of that, or most of that, is because uh, of the way that corporations have stuck their talons in uh, both the insurance uh, and the healthcare provision side uh, of healthcare. And so uh, our hope was to take this uh, topic back out of the politics and back into put it back into the personal uh, by situating it in the circumstances that people find themselves in day in and day out in our country. And uh, in doing so, we hope that we can uh, ignite and engage a conversation that people are having all the time across their dinner tables about how we can do this better. And we believe that Medicare for All is uh, the right answer to that question. So without further ado, I, I want to jump in um, and, and share, actually, uh, let me pass it over to Micah to, to share some context, and then we'll jump into the book. So I come to this issue as someone who's always believed that healthcare is and ought to be treated as a human right. But then I got to medical school in Massachusetts, where most people have some form of health insurance. And nevertheless, patients are just being failed every day, whether it's medications that we know folks need and they can't afford, or they're worried about whether they can afford going into the hospital, or in an emergency, they go bankrupt because they did get the care that they needed. So what brings me to, to the topic is the belief ultimately that we can do better. And the, the reason I'm so excited to share the stage with Abdul and Nick and to join all of you in conversation is ultimately that hope and that belief that we know that we can do better. And oftentimes we know what we need to do. It's a question of mustering the, the courage to get there. So Abdul, why don't you tell us a bit about how, where this conversation starts with making healthcare right in America? Absolutely. So um, when you talk about Medicare for all, it's easy for uh, the opponents of uh, real reform to paint it as radical. But I, I want to situate us back in history. The first time that Congress took up its responsibility to promote the general welfare, and I quote uh, from the Constitution, uh, the preamble to the Constitution, and that takes us all the way back to 1798. As early as 1798, the fifth Congress passed and President John Adams signed an early attempt by the fledgling Republic to promote the general welfare, an act for the relief of sick and disabled seamen. At that time, international trade was vital to the well-being of the United States, although being a sailor was a particularly dangerous trade. To protect its merchant marine, Congress passed the law creating a system of government-run hospitals for seamen funded by a mandatory tax on their earnings. As science advanced through the 19th and 20th century, American government acted as a catalyst to convert new knowledge into broad improvements in general welfare, improving sanitation, putting fluoride in drinking water, ensuring widespread vaccination, funding new hospital construction, and guaranteeing health insurance for senior citizens. Modern healthcare has developed tools that humanity couldn't have imagined in 1787, from vaccines and antibiotics to robotic surgery and targeted immunotherapy. Because of these advances and so many others, nearly 250 years after the people of the United States ordained and established the Constitution, American life expectancy has more than doubled. And yet, perhaps by the standard of our time and the power and wealth of our country, we are yet failing to promote the general welfare. Life expectancy in the United States is nearly six years shorter than in Japan, the longest lived country in the world. American infant mortality ranks 55th in the world, and the American health disparities by race and socioeconomic status are among the world's steepest. Perhaps worse, Life expectancy has stagnated, even falling, for three straight years between 2015 and 2017. Rather than the infectious diseases of the past, the diseases with a predilection for the young today are diseases of despair, drug overdose, alcohol misuse, and death by suicide. For the population at large, cancer and heart disease are the top killers. For this mediocrity, Americans pay by far the steepest price for health care in the world. We spend 18% of all of the money in our economy on health care. We are projected to spend $12,000 per person on healthcare in 2021, double the average in comparable countries, and our costs are increasing rapidly. Micah? So the American healthcare system is an enormous topic. It affects hundreds of millions of us, and it, we spend trillions of dollars every year. But as a doctor, I think about healthcare one patient at a time. So I want to read to you the story of a remarkable woman that Abdul and I got to know over the course of writing this book. Lisa Cardillo will never forget her 15th wedding anniversary. After waving goodbye to their three children, Lisa and her husband Dominic drove across the state to Granville, a few miles from Lake Michigan. They had more than their anniversary to celebrate. Dominic, 
who'd suffered a malignant brain tumor at just 33 years old, was three years past his cancer diagnosis. They were eager for a fresh start. But just as they were about to enjoy the day on Lake Michigan's sandy beaches, Lisa felt a sharp burning in the center of her chest. Then came the crippling nausea in abdominal pain. Though Lisa was 36 years old and otherwise healthy, she knew that something was terribly wrong. The Cardillos knew better than to call an ambulance. Dominic's had cost them $800 when he was first diagnosed. They rushed to the car and started Googling nearby hospitals. Dominic stepped on the gas. Lisa's left arm started to go numb. As Lisa walked into the emergency room, she went into cardiac arrest. With her heart no longer pumping blood, she crashed to the floor. The emergency room personnel started performing CPR then and there. Over the next nine agonizing days at the hospital, Lisa was diagnosed with a heart attack caused by spontaneous coronary artery dissection, a deadly tearing of one of the arteries that supply blood to the heart. Thankfully, Lisa survived, but that was just the beginning of her ordeal. All of this was extremely expensive. The hospital sent a bill for $185,460. For five months, she had to wear a defibrillator vest, which was another $5,000 a month. Then more bills for cardiac rehab, follow-up appointments, and prescription. And here's the thing. The Cardillos have health insurance. Unlike the 30 million Americans who don't have it, they have health coverage through Dominic's job as an automotive engineer. Before his diagnosis, they tried to save on premium costs by choosing an insurance plan with a high deductible, meaning they would need to spend more before their insurance kicked in. That left them with $12,000 in uncovered medical bills. Their friends eventually started the GoFundMe page and threw an in-person fundraiser to partially allay their debts. Together, they raised nearly $8,000, just enough to get them back on solid footing. But when January 1st rolled around, their deductible reset, and they found themselves back at square one paying for Dominic's ongoing treatment. And the toll was the personal toll. Lisa spent hours on the phone with the various hospitals, slabs, and insurance where they owed money, not to mention pleading with their insurance company to cover the cost of this or that treatment. More than once, she'd found herself crying to the faceless insurance bureaucrat on the other end of the line. She told us, when your medical bills become more stressful than your husband's brain cancer diagnosis, something is not right. Morbidly, Lisa jokes that her favorite bill is the one for cardiopulmonary resuscitation, the manual CPR she got in the emergency room. For $568, the hospital personnel saved her life. But because she hadn't met her deductible, she paid for it out of pocket. It's the best $568 I ever spent, she said. But should she have had to spend it at all? So I find Lisa's story powerful because it shows both the problems in the current system and the potential for Medicare for all. So what is Medicare for all? Really, it's, it's a simple idea. The government guarantees all Americans comprehensive health insurance under a single publicly funded plan. That means everyone would have coverage, not just folks like Lisa and Dominic who have it through their job, but anyone. Coverage would be more comprehensive. You would end the high deductibles and narrow networks for care that lead to so many issues. You'd crack down on the overcharging for care that the corporations in the, in the healthcare industry do charge us and would eliminate lots of the administrative waste that increases costs in the current system, all while moving the cost of our healthcare system away from low income and middle income folks. But to, to get from here to there requires a lot of politics and a lot of in terms of political movement. So Abdul, tell us about the politics. Well, look, in order to get there, we're going to have to continue to organize, to build a movement founded in people uh, sharing their own personal stories, their frustrations with the system and deciding to do something about it. That willingness to come together, to build a movement, that's the only way forward. We're always going to be undergunned when it comes to money. We're always going to be underpowered when it comes to political access. But what we can do is take back our democracy and move it in the direction uh, of real change. Um, I think this dovetails nicely, dovetails nicely with uh, the, the work that uh, Nick Freudenberg has been doing uh, his entire career, exploring the consequences of corporations uh, for our health. And, and part of that has been the impact on our politics. And so uh, I'll hand it off to him to share a bit more about his excellent book, At What Cost. Nick, take it away. 
Thank you so much. And thanks, Abdul and Mike. And uh, really a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, a really important book that you wrote. So uh, At What Cost is really a guide for apocalypse watchers. And it turned out the last few years uh, were really banner years for those who like to watch apocalypses. Most visibly and obviously we had the COVID-19 pandemic with all the illnesses and deaths here in the United States and around the world. But we also watched the unfolding climate emergency, uh, 30 tropical storms in 2020 alone, more than $30 billion worth of damage, uh, many lives lost. Uh, and the climate emergency also uh, disrupts agriculture, contributes to uh, a variety of forms of pollution. Then we've also had some more uh, slow motion disasters, uh, some of which Abdul and Mike have talked about, the deaths of despair, closely related to the use of opioids, alcohol, firearms, and also the changes in working conditions. Uh, We've also seen the rise of chronic diseases, diabetes, cancer, heart disease, cardiovascular disease. And the question I ask in at what cost is what are the common drivers of these apocalypses of the 21st century? And the case I make is underlying these very different health conditions are the changes in capitalism of, uh, in the long view from the 1970s on, in the shorter view since the 2007 fiscal crisis. And we've seen changes in, uh, in, the, uh, in modern capitalism as a result of globalization where uh, unhealthy products, uh, pollution uh, and, and desperate migrants uh, travel around the world. Uh, we've seen uh, financialization, a growing part of the world economy controlled by the financial sector, and they cut wages, uh, cut corners on pollution and product safety, all in the interests of increasing uh, their articles. There was a recent uh, article in the New Yorker about uh, mobile home communities being bought up by private equity and then uh, charging for water, charging for sanitation, uh, making them unlivable and unaffordable. Uh, and we've also seen uh, deregulation uh, of the financial industry, of the uh, public health deregulation, environmental deregulation, making the world we live in more toxic. And finally, we've seen increasing control of science and technology by corporations. And so the wonderful discoveries of the last uh, decades that could be used to save lives instead are used to increase profits, even if that ends up harming lives. So that's the first idea that capitalism has become more toxic and is the underlying cause of the most serious health crises facing the world today. The second idea is that those aren't abstract ideas. They're experiences that millions, uh, tens of millions of people in the United States and billions of people around the world experience. And in the book, I talk about six pillars of health. Uh, Mike and Abdul have already talked about one, healthcare. The other five I look at are food, where we've seen the global food supply become increasingly the cause of uh, diet-related diseases, now the primary cause of premature death and preventable illness here in the United States and increasingly around the world. Uh, at education, where education has become a profit center, and we've seen privatization of childcare, primary education, and, second, and, and higher education. And increasingly, people graduate from college uh, with debts that they worry will prevent them from achieving their life goals. Uh, work, uh, we've seen the rise of the low-wage workforce whose wages and benefits 
uh, are unable to enable them to support a family and who are also exposed to working conditions. In transportation, we see the creation of transportation apartheid. Some sectors of the population having access to mobility and others not. And the dominant form of transportation, cars, uh, SUVs, pickup trucks that pollute the environment and discourage the development of mass transit, which promotes health in all sorts of ways. And finally, uh, the uh, big tech has forced us to uh, turn over to Amazon and Google and Facebook our most private actions uh, in order that they can sell that data about us to advertisers who can in turn try and convince us to consume more unhealthy products to uh, exacerbate social and political divisions because controversial ideas hateful ideas get more clicks and more likes than uh, ordinary ideas or life-saving ideas. So these six pillars of health are increasingly undermined by 21st century capitalism, making it harder and harder for people to get what they need to stay healthy. But here's the good news. Around the world and here in the United States, uh, Every health problem we face, every social problem we face, somewhere people are mobilizing to change that. In the food movement, the climate movement, the labor movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, the dreamers movement, people are mobilizing to take back their right to control their lives, to say that we need a politics where it's not corporations that dominate and that decide what government does, but ordinary people. But the problem is, that each of those movements is uh, siloed. And with it, we've had a great difficulty putting together a common agenda. And one of the uh, suggestions I make and at what cost that I think resonates with what Abdul and Micah are saying is that health and well being constitute a foundation for the many movements active in the United States today. And if we can start to find the ways that the environmental movement and the food justice movement and the labor movement, to take three that I've done some work with, can find common ground as exemplified by the Green New Deal and begin to make common demands that then we will have uh, begin to accumulate the power that will contest uh, the current uh, uh, status quo and the current holders of power. And in order to bring those movements together, we need to start to define a common agenda, one that uh, creates incentives for people to work together. And I suggest a few ideas that can begin to bring that together. And this isn't rocket science. These are common ideas. But what we need is the ability to uh, resolve the conflicts that have divided different movements in the past and bring them together. So one idea is to grow the public sector. In many sectors, in food, for example, a big part of the food sector is already public. Uh, SNAP pays billions of, billions of dollars a year to provide food to low-income populations. Institutional food programs spend taxpayer dollars to provide food to school children. Uh, health departments regulate food safety. But the problem is that that money that we spend in the public sector isn't always used to advance public good. And we need to be thinking of how we as uh, citizens, as taxpayers can ensure the public sector and food starts to create an alternative to the private sector, which is now selling unfortunately mostly unhealthy food that contributes to diet-related diseases. And similarly, in the pharmaceutical industry, in the healthcare industry, in education, in transportation, the public sector can begin to create an alternative competition for the private sector and show that it's possible to meet human needs and not have making a profit be the only concern. Second, we need to level the playing field. We need to look for ways to 
bring the voices of ordinary people, of workers, of women, of Blacks and Latino and American Indians into the political arena and to reduce the influence uh, aggravated by the Citizens United decisions, uh, aggravated by the billions of dollars of lobbying money and dark money that corporations and wealthy individuals spend to get their way. And I think the power of a movement organized around health is that it can begin to uh, absorb and turn into practice the lessons that some of us learned from the women's movement many decades ago. And that is that the personal is political and the political is personal. And when we can translate the uh, challenges that people encounter in pursuing their diet, their transportation, their children's education, their health care, into the struggles against the corporations that are profiting at the expense of our well-being, then we have the foundation for a movement that can really make a difference. And we can look also to our past to see successes. Every generation has struggled to improve living conditions. And I'm unwilling to buy the argument that there is no alternative to the toxic capitalism that has developed in, this, uh, in these recent decades. And I look forward to working with others uh, to create a world where we can be sure our children and our grandchildren will inherit a world in which uh, they can prosper, be healthy, and the planet can survive. I really look forward to uh, questions from all of you and your responses to these two books about how we address the health challenges facing us. All right, well, that was, um, that was great. Uh, really appreciate uh, that overview, Nick, and I know the book comes out tomorrow. I uh, hope folks will check it out. It is a, a critical read. Um, Politics and Prose is the place to buy it, not Amazon, because there'd be a tremendous level of hypocrisy in doing that. Um, but uh, <laughs> but uh, would, um, would, would love to just open up uh, a, a, a discussion here. You know, one of the interesting uh, aspects that, um, that you touched on in, in your discussion and you touched on the book, and I was really um, fortunate to, uh, to uh, get an early uh, view of the book, and it, it is actually well written and, and, and really thoughtful and connects a number of ideas that I think are really important, um, is the role of financialization. And um, I touched on it in my first book, uh, Healing Politics. Um, and the interesting thing about the financialized world is that we're no longer trading on even the value of a corporation. We're trading on the potential value as determined by some set of traders on Wall Street. And when you start trading um, in that particular way and you put all of these different kinds of corporations on the same playing field, it creates a set of incentives that then uh, that then permeate across sectors uh, in ways that um, that I think are really really damaging. If if there were a set of reforms that you felt like could fundamentally change the way that financialization uh, impacts healthcare specifically. Um, what would that look like to you? Um, and, you know, I've got some opinions on, uh, on the healthcare front as well, but um, what would that look like to you? And, you know, how, how do you think that that could uh, play out over the long term? And then what are the implications in terms of the kind of health reform that actually shapes patients' lives? So uh, I think I'd point to a few things. One is, I think uh, both contributing to financialization and uh, a uh, complicating factor in itself is increasing monopoly control. And often the monopoly control is very tightly tied with the financial sector. So in the food industry, uh, we see now a, a dozen uh, corporations that really uh, control the world's uh, global food supply. And we've had the beginning of talk uh, after the defeat of Trump and with uh, uh, the seeing some of the economic problems, especially in this COVID pandemic, of really enforcing antitrust laws in a new way and developing new antitrust laws. I think the second uh, 
problem is there are now no penalties for financial players to come in, invest in an industry, disinvest, disrupt, and in the process uh, cause health problems. In my book, uh, I talk about cancer care. And I was horrified to learn that uh, a significant proportion of community oncology practices, the practices that take care of people with cancer have been bought up by private equity firms. They see this as an investment. And when they buy up an oncology practice, they look for who's bringing in the greatest amount of revenues and who's bringing in the least. And they then ask that practice to fire the doctors who are bringing in less revenue and look for more doctors who can bring in more revenue. This disrupts the care of cancer patients. It pushes uh, caring doctors who spend more time with their patients out of practice. And oftentimes after they've uh, reaped the profits from these oncology practices for a few years, they sell it off, again, disrupting care. That's an example of financialization uh, wrecking an industry. And I think we've just recently in the last few days seen some revelations about the nursing home industry where we've seen similar trends, private equity coming back, coming in, uh, buying them up because they see it as a promising way of making revenues and then cutting back staffing. Uh, fair work rules where you can't hire, you, that you can't lay off workers simply in order to make some more profits. Uh, liability for the health problems that your financial practices ensure, those are intermediate steps, I believe, for reducing the burden of financialization. You, you said you have some ideas too, Abdul. We're gonna to speak too in the idea of monopolies in the healthcare sector. I think hospitals are the best example of that, where now you have the most communities, especially in cities and also in rural communities too. There's one or maybe two hospital systems that dominate the local market. Now more than 90% of hospital markets are, are highly concentrated. And it flips this idea of choice on its head where so often the criticism against a proposal like Medicare for all is that it reduces your choice. But the reality is, in healthcare today, it's largely a patchwork of local monopolies. And that increase our healthcare cost because the, first of all, the reason America spends so much more than other countries on healthcare is because our prices are higher. It's not because we use more care. And one of the big reasons our prices are higher is because they're set by negotiations between hospitals and private insurance companies. And if you're a hospital that's a local monopoly, the insurance companies can have a really hard time saying no when you ask for a price increase year after year after year. And that's how we end up spending over a trillion dollars, literally a trillion dollars on hospital care alone uh, with, with those extremely high prices. But I think there's even a broader point here too about the, the whole idea of relying on markets in different spheres of our lives. And going back to Adam Smith, the, the whole idea of being in the market, you know, the, the famous quote about the baker. The baker doesn't bake bread out of the goodness of his heart, but by trying to increase his own profits, he bakes a lot of bread that helps everyone else. The idea that if individuals and companies pursue their own profits, along the way, they're gonna help other folks. And that may well be the case in, in many instances in terms of consumer products. But when we look in healthcare, it's just not true that what is most profitable is best for health. It's often the complete opposite. And you know, the example that Nick used of private equity ownership of nursing homes, I mean, we've seen the research come out just over the last few months. The rates of death are higher in the nursing homes that are owned by private equity. You know, it turns out that by cutting corners to increase your profits, you also increase, increase the death rates of your patients. Or we saw that uh, in the so-called surprise medical billing, where it turns out that a great way to increase profits is to buy up an emergency room staffing firm, wait for people to have heart attacks, and then send them extraordinarily high bills. So just th the very idea that by letting people pursue profits, you're going to improve people's health 
when it comes to healthcare, it's it's just not true. And I think that speaks to Nick's broader point about increasing the role of the public sector in healthcare. And you know, it, it dovetails very nicely because what Medicare for all is is an invitation to rethink the way that we think about healthcare, to have it not be based on this consumer product model, but to have it be based on a public good model. And what I found in the, uh, in the five other industries I looked at, in each of them, the push for profits uh, is what created the, uh, the increased push for profits is what created the newly toxic uh, characteristics of that industry. And I think the question is, who writes the rules? You know, even Adam Smith understood that there needed to be rules about what for-profit companies could do. In the case of the food industry, as I said, increasingly, uh, now something like 57% of the calories that Americans consume are what are called ultra-processed foods, foods high in fat, sugar, salt, with dozens of additives, flavorings, uh, stabilizers, et cetera. Uh, a, a growing body of scientific evidence shows that those are the products most associated with increasing rates of diabetes and hypertension. And why does the food industry like ultra-processed food? Because it's very profitable. You can ship it around the world. You can leave it on a shelf for a long time. You can uh, use the industrial crops like corn and soy and sugar to produce it. And uh, healthier food would need to be uh, grown and distributed on a different scale. And that provides less opportunities for monopolized industries to make profits. So I think we, we need to examine both who's gonna set the rules about profit and public good, and then what's the scale of uh, providing healthcare, providing food, providing education that offers people uh, uh, healthful opportunities. The only place that I was going to add here, and I, I think that's um, that's a, that's an exceptional way to summarize it, is that in you know in healthcare we almost have monopolization two two sets of monopolies in one industry that are constantly toggling off of each other in a uh, almost a death spiral to raise prices. So you have monopolization on the provider side, which Micah spoke to, and then you have monopolization on the insurance side. And in some respects, what Medicare for All tries to do is undercut the monopolization, right, on, on this side with what is in effect a monopsony, right, the, the sort of contrapositive uh, of a monopoly um, on behalf of patients through one insurer. And, um, and in some respects, right, the, the, the economics work out the same way. The question becomes uh, what the political economy of it looks like and, and who it's operating for. The insurance industry, as it stands, right, the 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 entire profit model, is to figure out how to get enough people to pay for uh, healthcare insurance, and then to figure out how to keep enough of that money as profit. That that's the way the system works. People pay for their healthcare, and you keep some of it as profit, and you pay as little out as possible. In fact, uh, you know they 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 call it a medical loss ratio. Um, and, uh, and in some respects, what, what Medicare for All says is instead of operating that kind of system to keep as much as possible, we are going to work the exact opposite by creating one insurer that operates on behalf of the taxpayer, on behalf of the American public, uh, so that we can reduce prices as much as possible uh, and collectivize as much as possible. And it's that kind of broad-based thinking that I think we need to engage with. And I'll tell you what I uh, find um, both heartening and also frustrating about where we are right now politically. We just passed a $1.9 trillion uh, COVID relief package. And inside that package uh, is, I think, one of the most promising laws now uh, in the past several decades, which is the childhood tax credit, which if it becomes, um, if it becomes permanent, uh, you are now talking about what is a direct response to uh, the 40-year governing Reaganist consensus uh, that says that we should be investing in people because they're people. And that is a big deal. And in the same, very same bill, right, in the very same law, uh, you have a m magnificently large giveaway uh, to health insurance companies 
to do the thing they should have done in the first place, which in the presence of the biggest profits they've ever made in 2020, uh, to pay them to give people health care who were kicked off of their health care because of the system as it stands. And so it is that kind of contradiction in terms um, that we're going to have to try and solve uh, in the next couple of years. And, uh, and I think this is sort of where we are. There is a real push uh, to invest in government as a real solution. And at the same time, so much corporate capture on behalf of a set of industries that stop us from doing that. And the question of how we resolve that, I think, is going to be uh, the real challenge. And um, Nick, I'd love, I'd love to hear your perspective uh, on that and, and where we go from here, given um, sort of where, where, where Biden seems to be moving and where the administration seems to be moving on some of these issues. Well, I was gonna wonder if, uh, I think we have a few questions from uh, people in the audience. Should we maybe turn to that and then Great. Uh, come back to some of these questions? Uh, and Bashan, do you want to uh, read out some questions to us? Absolutely. And we have um, quite a few detailed questions. So uh, let's try to start with some of the shorter ones. Uh, David Moore asks, or says, in TR Reads, The Healing of America, it describes several different models of universal health care around the world. Um, what model in particular do you all think is the best model for the U.S.? Would it be Medicare for all? And could you explain why you think so? I mean, I'm gonna go ahead and say we're biased because we wrote a book called Medicare for All. Um, <laughs> that being said, uh, let me explain why I actually do believe um, single payer is the right approach here. There, there are a lot of approaches that have rendered um, that have rendered uh, uh, universal health coverage. The hard part right now is that the corporations and the sector have gotten so powerful that any real change that doesn't fundamentally challenge their power renders them capable of continuing to game the system. The ACA is a perfect example of that. You know, one of the things that uh, that has happened because of the ACA, which, by the way, I thought was is a really meaningful reform. So I don't mean to poo poo the ACA, but one of the things that happened is that it limited the amount of money that a health insurer could make on any given transaction. And it inadvertently created a disincentive, which leaves insurers wanting to raise the overall price of health care because they're only allowed to take a certain proportion. So if you only get a certain proportion of the pie and you want to maximize the amount of pie, you just make a bigger pie. And, and that's exactly what's happened, right? And so it's accelerated the cost. And so if you don't deal with the, 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 the fundamental um, inefficiency of a for-profit insurance industry in a situation where that industry has gotten so powerful, then I worry about what other unintended consequences you might get. Now, you might argue, well, if they're so powerful, how do you think you're in effect going to abolish them with Medicare for all? And that's a fair point. But I do think that history has taught us that, that, that the industry will go all out to defeat any form of reform, regardless of how serious or how big. And so I would rather fight one fight, not to have to fight future fights in, in the future, rather than continuing to have to have these, uh, these all out battles with the industry every 10 years to get incremental reform. And that's my take on it. Um, I'd love to hear uh, Micah's and, and Nick's. Yeah, I mean, just to say, great book by T.R. Reid goes around the world. One of the things that got me interested in health policy, I will say that I think it's there's a little bit of a misunderstanding. One of the, the talking points we hear is that, you know, there are many paths to universal coverage. And to some extent, that's true. But many of those paths would leave out people like Lisa Cardillo, who we talked about at, at the top of the program. If, if the goal, if we define our goal simply as to make sure that everyone in America has some form of health insurance, I mean, that's better than what we have now. But you still have people with medical bankruptcy. You still have people dying because they can't get the treatments that they need. You still have people that are cutting back on rent payments or going to the grocery store because their treatments are so expensive. So it's not just about getting everyone covered. It's about getting everyone great, comprehensive and quality health coverage and also controlling costs and doing it in an equitable way. So, you know, we don't have time to go through all the proposals, but you know, we've, we've got a whole chapter in our book where we break down 
the Medicare for all and a public option and market-based reforms to try to delve into some of these details. But if you want a system that's universal, comprehensive, contains cost and is equitable, I don't think you can get any better than Medicare for all. And I would raise a slightly uh, different point in thinking about this question. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a supporter of Medicare for all of a universal uh, system. Uh, but I think we need to spend as much time thinking as how we get there as where we're going. Uh, and that the failure of a more universal healthcare system, in my view, has come about not because we haven't gotten it exactly right, but because the forces in favor have not been able to gather the political power to uh, overcome the special interests that are wedded to the status quo because they profit from it. And so I think we really need to be asking, what are our political strategies for bringing together the uh, people who are now already in the healthcare, in the healthcare for all movement, with the labor movement, with Black Lives Matter, uh, with uh, immigrant, immigrants and dreamers? What would be the strategies for bringing those groups together to say, here's a healthcare system that will benefit us all, and I will support this healthcare system if you support my minimum wage proposal. If we look at uh, the New Deal, for example, it was when there were multiple social movements with a shared set of demands that they could bring into the political arena and that they could make uh, elected officials fear that the consequences for not giving in were greater than the consequences for uh, acceding to people's demands for a better life, better health care, you know, better working conditions. So I think we need to spend a lot of time thinking about how do we get from where we are? And I don't think that's going to be a quick and easy. And it's not having, it's not only having the right legislative package, although that's important too. Uh, it's having a political strategy and having a commitment to finding common ground with all the forces that are uh, ready and willing to work for change. Thank you very much for your answers. Um, here is a question from an anonymous attendee, and the question is, um, would Medicare for All at least somewhat address the problem of negligence in administration of medical care by hospitals or individual practices? Um, specifically, would there be less focus on profits where that enables, uh, I guess, a more uh, equitable administration of the health care? Yeah, so as I understand this question, you know, it's coming back to what does it mean to try to sell healthcare for a profit and as a consumer product? And I just think one piece of this that gets lost is, yes, it's really expensive to, to sell healthcare as a consumer product. Um, and yes, it's really bad for, for people's health and it's bad for equity. But it's also just a horrific human experience. And I, I was really struck by what Lisa told us, where even when a loved one had a life-threatening cancer diagnosis, it's just trying to deal with this system at times was just as bad. And that's, that complexity has a huge human cost. And we see that on the physician side as well. The, the constant intrusion of financial concerns into the doctor-patient interaction or the deep penetration of the insurance company into the exam room and having to constantly be thinking about what is and will not be covered. I do think that there is a, a human cost to it in terms of something that, in my view, should be preserved, that when, when people go uh, to get health care, they're entering a different space, you know, a space where you're seeing as a human being and are treated with dignity for that reason. And I think that there is a, a big loss in, in the way that we're treating healthcare now. And you know, in, in a sector healthcare where tens of millions of Americans are spending every working day of their life working in this sector, I don't think we can underestimate the, 
the benefits of trying to move away from that model. And to uh, just uh, connect it to another sector, I think what we're seeing in education is the increasing movement of uh, capital and finance into the educational system, into all different levels, where we see uh, the same risks of uh, an apartheid system where uh, the quality of education, like healthcare, will depend on people's ability to pay, uh, where we'll see uh, the racial stratification uh, even further intensified that we also see in our healthcare system. And, and so not having a social understanding of where private capital will make things worse and not better, you know, not having a way for ordinary citizens rather than only investors to decide what can be private and what needs to be public, that uh, really puts, puts our democracy in peril, I think, and certainly our quality of life. Thank you. So here's a question, um, seemed more maybe perhaps a strategic question. Daniel asks, would you say that part of the drive toward Medicare for all should involve plugging the real gaps that currently exist within Medicare as it's offered to those over 65 and then extending that now seamless program to everyone? So the, the better way to sort of think about Medicare for all isn't just Medicare for all. It's, it's, it'd probably be more better described as improved and extended Medicare for all. And um, there are many gaps in Medicare. And in some respects, they're part of the same uh, corporate effort to undercut the public uh, provision of public goods that, uh, that Nick so well writes about. And uh, if we're serious about, about I investing in um, Medicare for all, it has to be a better version than the one we have. It would cover uh, dental and, and vision and, uh, and, and, and hearing. It would, um, uh, it would address the absurd sort of weird system that we, we use to pay for prescription drugs, and it would empower Medicare to uh, negotiate uh, prescription drugs with uh, pharmaceutical manufacturers. Um, and beyond that, it would um, ideally uh, address the gaps that exist that leave uh, seniors paying co-pays uh, and deductibles that, that really put them in trouble and force them to get Medicap coverage. So um, yes, it, it would need to be a better version of this. In a lot of ways, the name Medicare for All is, is a messaging tool um, that is not fundamental to the good that is, that is being uh, described when we talk about it, um, but it has, it has gotten such wide uh, pickup and become such a household discussion that we're, we're sort of stuck with it in, in some respects, although I wouldn't be surprised in the, if the next couple of years there was a bit of a rebrand. Um, and so when we talk about Medicare for all, what we mean is single payer uh, health coverage and single payer means a single insurer that is the government of the United States um, that would be offering a far more comprehensive set of services than the one that Medicare currently covers uh, in a truly public way. So uh, ideally without the same kinds of games that you know Medicare Advantage quote unquote uh, offers. And I think the broader point here is about the political risks of letting so much private influence into a public program, right? So anyone over 65 knows, as Abdul alluded to, Medicare doesn't cover vision, dental, and hearing. You know, so that seems like a very obvious fix. You know, we, we could just simply pass a law um, to, to cover those benefits. And when I worked in Congress, I worked in uh, the member of Congress who I worked for was the sponsor of a bill to do just that. What, what I think folks might not realize is that there is a very powerful political lobby against extending those um, protections to seniors universally. And those are the private insurance companies who sell those products on top of Medicare. So you have this very powerful and influential industry that has a vested interest in stopping our public programs from getting better. And I think that's, that's the real risk and a real challenge. And I think it's sometimes lost when we get into the weeds of looking at you know, Medicare versus kind of the private versions of Medicare. We miss the big picture, which is that 
because we've already let so much private insurance into Medicare, we have a huge vested interest in stopping the Medicare program itself from developing um, into a better version of itself. So, you know, that comes down when we get, we get lots of questions about Medicare for all versus a public option, or if you have Medicare for all, should you have kind of private insurance that interacts with Medicare for all in some way? And there are very interesting and important debates to be had there and different countries do it in different ways. But I think one lesson that we see from the current Medicare program is, again, it's, it's a real risk to, to let a, a powerful industry have what's almost become veto power in, into making the universal program better for anyone. And I think that's something that we should keep in mind when we're pushing towards a, a new direction for health reform. And it, again, if I can bring a public health perspective to this, uh, improving our healthcare system uh, and the access to it and the quality of care and the affordability of care is an essential step for both improving the health of the American people and making us a more civilized country. But there is much more that we can do and need to do to be uh, a healthy people and a healthy planet. And uh, part of the uh, cost that we've paid for uh, keeping our focus, our policy focus on health to the healthcare system, uh, largely as a result of the health insurance industry and the pharmaceutical industry, which uh, has resisted any changes, is that we miss opportunities for prevention. The greatest number of cases of cancer have been prevented, not by anything the medical care system has done, but by control measures of tobacco, by uh, persuading people to smoke less cigarettes. Uh, we've, we've also you know, made important progress uh, in, uh, in reducing exposure to some, but not all chemicals and toxic exposures. And so our potential to become a healthier nation depends on looking at a whole range of social policies around wages, around environmental protection, uh, around food. Uh, one of my uh, a colleague of mine who was actually involved in writing the ACA said his mantra was fix food first, you know, that if we fix our, our diet, we will be uh, preventing so many people from going to the emergency room, from being hospitalized uh, with diet related diseases. These aren't two mutually exclusive paths. We need to do both things, but it would be a mistake if the new policymakers in Congress and the White House put all their attention on health, on reforming our healthcare system and didn't pay attention to the huge benefits we would get from investing in creating uh, healthier environments and a healthy diet and healthier transportation systems. Absolutely, and as we're coming to the to the end of the hour, you know, I think that's the thing that I'm going to take away from our conversation this evening is these because the policies that were so enmeshed, and it goes both ways. We all know that what happens outside of the doctor's office and the hospital are so important about what happens for health, and we also know that what happens in the doctor's office and the hospital in terms of sucking up $4 trillion from our economy and huge parts of people's budgets, that also has an impact on the broader conditions that people live in. So what, what you know, my, my, my hope is, is to really take seriously, Nick, your charge in terms of how we can marry these movements together more effectively. I, I think the, the healthcare movement um, needs to be a more effective partner in all the efforts that you're describing and I hope that all the other movements you're describing could be closer allies in, in the healthcare movement as well. So I think I'm, I'm grateful for the chance to, to get to share the stage with you because I think I, I really resonate with that in, in the work that sort of doing in policy and politics. I really think that's, that shines a light forward. Thank you very much. We're, we're getting, uh, we're short on time and we're also getting a lot of questions um, at the same time. Um, so what I will do is I will try to just present one last question um, before our time runs out. And this one is coming from 
Caroline, apologies if I mispronounce her name, but she says that I am a physician and she has always supported Medicare for all. And her question is simply, how would you finance Medicare for all? Let me just quickly jump in. I, I just, uh, on the point um, that, uh, that, that you were making, uh, that you collectively were making, I, I come to, to healthcare from public health. I was a health commissioner and um, the best way, the most important way that we can get to all of these broader social determinants and structural and eco-social determinants of health is to get healthcare out of the way and subjugate healthcare back under uh, public health. To the question of financing, um, the money is there. I mean, we spend 18% of all the money in our entire economy on healthcare, um, and it comes in the most oblong ways, in ways that leave people deeply insecure. Um, there are a couple of principal differences that I think we have to keep in our minds as we think about financing. The first is that uh, it is going to require taxes, and the question of who pays those taxes is an important question. There was a philosophical debate about how much of those taxes uh, we would ask um, uh, uh, working Americans to pay. And I fall on the argument that I think it's important that from the political economy perspective that everybody pays a bit in because when you look at uh, conservative um, arguments for uh, Social Security and Medicare, it almost always has to do with the fact that I paid into the system, ergo I, uh, I take from the system. And I think that uh, is a justification that's worth investing in here. The, the second aspect is that it needs to be far more progressive than our current system is right now. We know that poor people in America pay far more uh, for their health care as a function of what they earn. And under Medicare for All, uh, it would leave um, uh, corporations and the rich paying substantially more, and it's partly why uh, they oppose it. At the same time, the savings that come out of uh, addressing the bloated overhead, the accelerating uh, prices um, of, of, of our current system, save money. The CBO just recently scored uh, Representative Jayapal's Medicare for All bill and found that it would save uh, our system money and it would be covering the 10% of people who don't uh, actually have access to healthcare. And so uh, the the day-to-day -day operations is that it would appear like a bi-weekly or monthly tax um, and it would be far lower than what uh, most Americans pay right now. And I think it would be for a better, more secure service without uh, the out-of-pocket costs that put so many people in dire circumstances. Uh, and, and that um, itself is, is such an important benefit. And as you said, it can only be seen in the context of 40 years of tax policy of uh, uh, robbing for, you know, cutting taxes for the rich and uh, keeping them stable or increasing for the poor. And so it brings up the larger question of what's fair, you know, that uh, the tax allocation just 40, 50 years ago was dramatically different and people got wealthy and the wealthy people supported the tax system. But we've seen since the 70s a, a real uh, clawback on the part of the wealthiest sectors of society. And they've been remarkably successful in cutting their own taxes in and uh, reducing public expenditures on public services. So we need to rebalance that. And that applies to healthcare, it applies to education, it applies to public transportation, uh, to many sectors. Well, I'd like to thank each of you for this very insightful and information filled conversation. Um, and of course, I'd like to thank everyone who has tuned in from their homes or wherever you may be. Um, don't forget to go to the chat section where you can find links to purchase books from each of our authors today. And on behalf of Politics and Prose, I would like to say to everyone to stay well read and have a good evening or afternoon, depending on where you are. And thank you, Bashan. We appreciate your uh, moderation. Thank you. Thank you both. Great to talk with you. Thanks thank so you much. all. Thank you, Nick. Bye.